Hey everyone, thought I'd do some comic book thoughts on a stack of comics. I'm not sure what I'm going to say at all, whether I have much to say. Uh, I almost did this one live, but figured the, the video and audio might be a little better um, if I don't do it live. Last time I did something live, I was watching myself talk and it was out of sync and it was very distracting. But I'm a little bit, I don't know, on the frustrated side, just having to do with my daughter having an abscessed tooth and hassles with children's dentists. And in all, she's probably going to be three weeks before she gets it out. And it's just it's getting crazy. Um, <laughs> it's not a good way to get, <laughs> talking about that, it's not a good way to get into the mood for this. Um, read a lot of comics I really enjoyed. I'm just glancing at this pile. Uh, most of these are from this week, but not all of them. There are some that, that go back further. Uh, I'll just take them as they are on this here. I really liked Saviors. Um, had a little trouble getting into the artwork at first. Mostly, this is going to sound totally silly. I might be saying a lot of silly things tonight. Because of this guy's face, this guy's chin, he's the hero. Um, he's got a Hispanic name. I don't know if that's supposed to mean anything. Um, seems to be maybe in a sleepy southwestern town. And there's an alien invasion. Uh, it's... It's kind of a, it, well, so far it feels like a small comic that doesn't have anything big to say and it's just going to be kind of fun to read, even though, you know, it's an alien invasion. But um, it seems like the aliens have been around for a while, maybe, part of this town. I don't know. Um, it's definitely worth getting two ninety nine. Just kind of a minor fun comic. Uh, switching gears, Fantastic Four, really colorful. Um, one of the most colorful comics around, you might say. Uh, I really loved this issue. Um, I feel, you know, I feel like it ought to have gone downhill when Matt Fraction left. Of course, he's still here in spirit. But I just love all the little details about it. I, of course, know when I start reading FF that I'm not reading a straightforward serious comic book that it's kind of goofy kind of you know just a different take on comics and so it starts with them doing kind of a rhythmic rhyming plan of how to bring down Dr. Doom and as they set up their plan um, and it's really fun just reading that I loved all these details of their of their fight with remote robots against Dr. Doom's robots and the way they did this kind of extra strip of just action that's going on while everything else is going on in, uh, underneath for uh, several pages. Uh, I'm just loving uh, Mike Allred's art more and more. I'm really trying to decide whether to jump on when he does Silver Surfer or make that a wait for trade. I'm supposed to make that a wait for trade. Um, but according to my rules, um, but I think that I might be too tempted if the artwork is this fun. Um, so this is just a really fun issue. They're bringing all kinds of plot stuff that's been going on for 15 issues coming to a head. I have a feeling the next issue would be the last issue. I haven't seen that it's the last issue, but it feels like it's coming to an end, and I assume everything's being rebooted, and that, I mean, the artist is moving on, so I'm assuming the FF will either be rebooted or just dropped at this point. Um, but it's it's been a great run, and it's just been getting better and better. Itchy foot now. So um, this is just like a live show. Okay, one comic I did not get into. This might be a couple weeks old, I'm not sure. Um, part four of this kind of this arc of Thor that resembles a bit the Fellowship of the Ring. Um, it has taken some weird twists in this issue. 
Um, they felt kind of random, but we discover kind of a reason for it at the end. But I still just, I had to slog through this issue. I could hardly remember what happened in previous issues. Jason Aaron, there's nothing bad about it. It's okay. Um, but Jason Aaron did such great stuff, you know, where you really knew, yes, this is cool. Every issue during the God killer and the God bomb stuff. Um, and now it's just, I can see he has some kind of master plan for turning everything on its head, but it's just hard to sink my teeth into. Dead Boy Detectives was really quite extraordinary, um, given the kind of characters it had, and then really nice artwork, pleasing artwork. Um, I don't, whoa. My computer just put itself to sleep. That's unusual. Okay. I don't know. Um, I don't remember the Dead Boy Detectives. I thought I'd read all of Sandman, but maybe there's... Maybe there's some Sandman I haven't read. Because um, this is from the pages of Sandman, and I don't remember these Dead Boy Detectives. Now, unlike other people... Unlike some people... I liked Sandman, but I was very up and down on it back in the day, and I really haven't gone back to reread it, which I maybe should. Um, well, I have, I've reread Seasons of the Mists a lot, but other parts of it I read once and, and kind of stuffed into the back of my mind. Anyway, it's a story about these two ghosts who are kind of playing detective, and they've somehow influence this girl who has a near-death experience. The girl is very interesting. Her father's a rock star. Her mother's a performance artist. Um, I wonder if there's some little dig at, at Neil Gaiman there who's married to kind of a rock star who's a bit of a performance artist. I don't know. <laughs> Maybe that's stretching it, but that makes a really interesting background character. And the art, as I said, is quite cool um, by Mark Buckingham. Um, there they are. They're, they're pretending to put a tattoo on their newborn baby as a publicity stunt. Um, and yes, even in Vertigo, we get to look at that. Yum, yum. I'm really sick of that picture. So anyway, I'm... I don't have a lot to say about this. It didn't, like, even though I could intellectually tell it was really good, I didn't feel very involved in it. Uh, I'll probably pick up more issues. I picked it up this week, past week, because I ha wasn't picking up that much and I wanted more. Um, so I don't know where where this will fall for me as it progresses. It is good, but it's just not sinking its hooks into me yet. Um, yeah, so this order, the ordering here is completely random. I didn't plan it, um, as I usually do, at least sort through the comics a little bit beforehand. This flash is, for all we know, a fill-in issue before whatever's coming next comes. Um, I have a feeling I read that Brian Bucolato is going to continue writing it for a few more issues, but I might be wrong on that. Um, but anyway, this issue is written by Christos Gage and Neil Gouge. And we get a decent standard superhero story. One and done. Um, so that's not bad. Um, I think because I've been very involved with The Flash, I am interested in his continuing story and the kind of soap opera of his life. This kind of introduces someone who is supposedly a really close teacher of his who's been killed, so it's to give him special motivation. But as far as I remember of the previous 26 issues, I don't remember that person being a large figure in his life, as we're shown. It's interesting, the weird details I'll notice. Um, when, it, when I started reading this, issue, I kept noticing that how bulky the Flash was, you know, bulked up muscles. And I thought that just looks kind of wrong to me for my own personal vision of the Flash. I, I like the idea of a leaner runner's body on him. You know, these big 
chunky legs and chunky buttocks and chunky arms. Um, this didn't seem quite right to me. But um, it's not a big deal at all. But as the issue progressed, I think he actually got thinner. I first... Yeah, I, yeah, there I think he's getting a bit thinner. <laughs> uh, but I first noticed it when they showed him in his civilian dress, and he was very thin. So there's Barry Allen. So this is just me. This is a total off-track. doesn't really matter to whether the issue is good or not. But there's Barry Allen in, as a civilian. Look how skinny he is. Nothing like that bulked-up flash we saw at the beginning. And... Um, so yeah, so then he's he's looking a bit slenderer there. Um, still feeling a bit on the stocky side. Then in these distant shots, he's looks quite slender and thin, uh, more of a runner's body. Um, and I thought, well, that's just the distant shots. When we get the next close-up, he'll be muscular again. Um, but not really. <laughs> A little more muscular than the distant shots, but he's thinned down. So that's a, that's a weird thing. <laughs> I think uh, what we're seeing here is an artist doing a very good fill-in issue, but not really uh, paying too close attention to what he's doing. Uh, so you know, it was an okay issue. If it, if it just sort of continues like this, there's. Uh, I need it to be about the Flash's life, and I need the um, I need the soap opera with the Flash or something. This was just an okay issue, but it wouldn't keep me reading it. Uh, if it just is all like this, it'll be off my pull. Red Lanterns kind of feels like just a a crazy bloody Star Trek influenced <laughs> superhero comic or science fiction comic. Um, I really enjoyed it. It was kind of, there was some over-the-top stuff and, um, crazy stuff that, you know, pushes your believability, but, but overall cool. This artist, uh, Califore, Jay Califore is, is that really his name? I thought it was something else, is really growing on me. Um, yeah, Jake, Jake Calafiore. Nice colors and everything. Anyway, uh, Red Lanterns is just kind of fun reading still, um, but very satisfying fun reading for the moment. Um, which kind of is what you would want with the Flash fill-in issue. Um, yeah, so that's all i got to say about that, really. Baltimore Chapel of Bones. Interesting that this one of two issue might be the conclusion of Baltimore, or at least a sort of a wrapping up of his major quest of going after this vampire who killed his wife, etc. And what's interesting about it is 90% of the issue focuses on people who know Baltimore, and uh, Baltimore himself is only in a few panels um, leading up to his arrival at the very end of the issue for the, I guess, the big confrontation coming up. Um, and But that's not a complaint because this was a great issue. I really enjoyed it a lot. It was a good horror pulp um, period piece uh, alternate world fantasy. <laughs> it was just really good, really good. Um, I hope it's not the end of this series and I've got to think it may not be with just being a two-issue mini, um, given that there are other loose ends, like that Inquisitor who was, uh, spoiler for the last mini, uh, turned into a werewolf, I think, at the end of the last issue. So surely we've got to see him again, um, along with some other things again. I didn't realize, there's something in here, I need, you know, I haven't read all, I have read very little of the Baltimore series, just the most, the last mini and one or two other random issues. Um, apparently, at least according to the vampire, uh, Baltimore kind of brought him more into being, into what he is now. Um, 
that vampires were off in the background. So could all of this, what's happening in this world, actually be the fault of something Baltimore inadvertently did? Um, I got to read more. I got to dig back into the old Baltimore. And I do, I have picked up some more issues, uh, older issues, sort of random older issues that I want to read. Adventures of Superman. I enjoyed this thoroughly, although, like, for the first ten pages, I was thinking, oh, maybe, maybe this series that I've been loving, and it's not a series, sorry, that, I mean, it's a series as in a comic book, but it's just one-shot stories by different creators of a kind of mythical Superman, however they want to take the myth in whatever direction they want to do it in with each issue. Anyway, for the first ten pages, I thought, well, maybe this will be the, because I knew it was all one thirty-page story and I thought well maybe this will be the one story that lets me down um, but after the first 10 pages it just became very kind of hypnotic and I got very involved in it you could sort of see where it was going to an, to a large extent be, as an experienced comic book reader but it was still very satisfying and it had a nice emotional flavor to it uh, for Superman and it it's tricky to get at Superman's emotions normally so that was nice um, at first I had trouble adjusting to the art, although I think it was more the coloring. Um, although there was also something about this artist likes to kind of make people's mouths pooched up around there. and I don't know why that tiny detail just sort of distracted me here and there. But there's something, there's a style of coloring, um, where you do lots of these little white highlights in the, in the mix of things. And I don't know why, but that style really bugs me. Um, it somehow makes things look plasticky to me, and I keep noticing it, and it it makes me... It, maybe it makes things look a little more 3D, but it makes me kind of bounce off of them. There shouldn't be any reason why such a little thing should bother me so much. You can see all over Superman's body in this panel, um, there's little white highlights, and I don't know. Um, anyway, so after a while I got over that, but, but somehow that's a thing in coloring that, that I'm not keen on. Um, <laughs> here's a shot with the pooched up mouth that somehow bothers me. Um, but this artist was very good overall. Uh, so I still highly recommend uh, Adventures of Superman for someone who, if, if you're someone who wishes for some solid Superman... Um, still great short form storytelling. I didn't originally pick this one up, Justice League 3000. Um, maybe because of the one of the writers being J.M. D. Matias. Uh, but I heard people talk about it in a way that really intrigued me, uh, including Roger, um, but also other people. And then I once I got it, I just I just keep leafing through. I really enjoy the art and color here. Um, maybe even more in the not the scenes without the iconic superheroes in them. It just seems like really beautiful art to me. It's a little weirder when you see the superheroes and they've got these weird expressions on their faces and stuff. But um, I just really really dig this art and the story is actually very cool. Um, a far future story, obviously, with Justice League 3000 involving clones of the Justice League and um, two twins who run Cadmus and um, and have brought or the, are the people responsible for these clones, and they brought them back to fight some some evil enemy called the Five, which is interesting because I think there's five Justice League members, and they're they're hardly they seem completely selfish beings except maybe maybe the flash and green lantern um they if they're they seem like they're fighting for glory or to prove themselves um and they're fighting amongst themselves etc which makes it interesting just because of how it plays off of and against the mythos of the original justice league um so i recommend this a lot uh, of course, it's only the first issue. It could go south suddenly, but if it continues the way it's going here, it's going to be one of my favorite DC books. 
Okay, this turns out to be the last one in my little stack here. Clone number 13. It's amazing the wild the wild ride we went through we've gone through with clone those of us who've been reading it from the beginning. Uh I would say anyone anyone who's okay with a pretty bloody story should pick up clone um volume 1 and volume 2 of the trade well tells a complete story with a full end. We're now on a whole new story. I mean, you know who the characters are from the first story. Um but issues 11, 12, and 13 are the beginning of this new story uh, about... A, before it was kind of this conspiracy theory secret thing going on with the clones. Now it's about perhaps all of society trying to hunt down clones and crazy religious groups um, who are privately hunting down clones while the government's hunting down clones. And more than that, we have at least some part of the crazy religious group led by this woman who was married to one of the clones who she killed herself personally um, and who's obsessed by having the baby from the original of the clones and we get one we get a wild male rape of a male by a woman torture scene that is just amazing and I'm not a person who would normally say that <laughs> Um, but this book totally earns that. It totally fits um, with what's going on in the book. And as I say every month, you know, the art by Juan Jose Ripe just continues and continues and continues to be spot on and so incredibly detailed. There's an opening panel here that takes place at a Costco type of store, and the detail is just amazing. This guy is definitely the the heir of uh, Jeff Darrow, kind of doing Jeff Darrow work, Jeff Darrow level work, but a little less crazy, a little less crazy. I mean, this is a pretty crazy issue. Um, so anyway, I I this was a horrifying issue, and I loved it, um, and it it was all horror and grotesqueness that was totally earned by it and uh and in a, a horrifying emotional roller coaster ride as has the whole three issues so far of this new clone story um really the most torturous thing happened in the previous issue um with what the wife of the original of the clones had to do with their baby and and that continues as an issue in this issue so so really loved clone so yeah as you as you can see uh all good issues with the possible exception of thor it feels almost like jason aaron may pull this out somehow and and make me go back and say aha now i see what all of that was all about so Thanks for, uh, for watching, and uh, I'll be looking for everyone else's thoughts on comic books they've been reading lately. Happy New Year, um, and I'll talk to you later.